Welcome to the 2023 CFL season, everybody, and welcome to the first edition of the breakdown. The real, the real edition. I think we did back one like the winter when stuff didn't matter, and we were just like, "Hey, look at this craziness, free agency." And then we did a bunch of Twitter spaces for the CFL together. But it's good to be back with DT Derek Taylor uh, from 680 CJOB, of course, here on CFP. He is currently. Are you are you in the in the bowels of IG Field? Are you in the in the top? Where are we hiding today? Oh, I, I'm in the bowels. I am in the <laughs> bowels. It's it's interesting. Uh, just an inside thing. The media room is right next to the Bombers' gym. So Coach O'Shea will be expounding on the virtues of being a great teammate. And someone is hammering a 20 pound medicine ball against the wall, shaking the room. Oh, oh I hope the audio is okay. Yeah, I uh, I do remember that a little bit. Now that you say that you're in the media room, though, and I see the podium in, oh, like over your shoulder there, I 100% remember being in that room when I would go cover Tiger Cats games, which, hey, the Tiger Cats are coming into Winnipeg to play against the Bombers to kick off week one. And that is one of, if not the nicest media rooms, I think, in the CFL. As much as it's like kind of buried away and whatever, it's the quality of audio and everything. I know this is like a total weird technical thing, but... The Bombers actually do the the media room thing kind of right compared to some places around this league, no? Oh, yeah. No, they got the big sponsored backdrop, which is nine yeah. TVs. And then they drop the lights and light the podium, which yes. makes for a great camera shot for, for all the TV folks and the internet uh, broadcasting folks. So, yeah, no, they, they do chicken right here for sure. I, uh, I just want to touch on that a little bit before we get into some of kind of looking at the the season at large here as we're getting set to kick off things, of course, tonight with Calgary and BC, uh, is that the quality of team-produced content is so different. And I, I've been thinking about this, and again, I'm sure I could just reach out like a normal person and actually ask people these questions and probably get these answers, but... I genuinely wonder what it is because there was always the discussion of, well, the drive to survive stuff and it creates fandom. And then it was like, we need to get younger and we need to find more exciting things. We need more access. We need more. But it's kind of interesting to me because it's like, I'm sure that the different video production crews across the CFL and, and social media and all the rest, I'm sure they're all talking. I'm sure that they all are in you know meetings together and all the rest and getting on the same page about some things, but they're all kind of going about it a little bit differently. And mm -hmm. the reason that I've been intrigued by this is that like we know that Winnipeg has been fantastic in media creation for a while there, but now it's like I watched the Calgary Stampeders game day YouTube video with Natasha Stanishevsky. It was awesome. It was like totally revamped. I don't know if Natasha put her spin on it, if there's somebody in the shadows that's a producer that did that. That was friggin' awesome. I'm seeing what the Edmonton Elks are doing with their YouTube page with all access that they did for their preseason. I'm seeing the Argonauts doing a bunch of different creative things. The Hamilton Tiger Cats switching up what their things look like. The CFL's digital assets of the matchup graphics of the players looking like they're at like a boxing stare down against each other. <laughs> I just like, I'm. it's been amazing today as we're recording this on, on opening day that I'm just looking around the league and I'm like, man, this just looks different i don't know if this is the xfl kicking a lot of cfl people in the ass and saying you better figure out how to promote your game or what but have you enjoyed it the same way that i have oh yeah for sure ottawa red blacks have been doing the behind the scenes thing like yeah. there's the war room right they, they've taken that tact at it uh chris jones reading mean tweets about there, himself that's one that i forgot yes like like I, I haven't seen the mean tweets it's in my favorites but i assume it's like this man looked like foghorn, leghorn, smoking <laughs> 10 packs of like just whatever it might be, right? Like it's yeah, it's incredible. And and that was that was the thing. Uh drive to survive changed the game for everybody. That's unlimited money and unlimited access. Yeah. Right. So you you need some sort of control. And people say, well, why don't the C why doesn't the CFL do A, B, and C? And you go, uh, to some degree, that's the teams that know their communities the best and know their fan bases the best. Have them reach out to it. And you you mentioned getting younger, like the the Riders crew and the Bombers crew are the ones I've seen up close just calling games for those teams. You get 20-somethings with cameras and, you know, almost free reign, and they're going to produce some incredible stuff and stuff that resonates with people their age. And, you know, because if you hand it to me at my age, I'd be like, oh, there's hey, some man. numbers, uh right? So getting young people creating the content and yeah. giving them a lot of access and and freedom to be creative has been fantastic. Yeah, I 100% agree. This is something that I've heard Dan Levitar talk about on his show, which is um, the young people get to decide what's cool. Like, we don't get to decide what's cool. Young people decide what's cool, and they're the ones that are 
then being put in charge a lot of different teams across the league are, are employing people who are younger than us to create content for people that are younger than us that has to be the strategy because honestly like i'm 31 right now i feel as though if you were to put a phone in my hand and say here we're going to pay you a salary go make some cool shit i <laughs> i would i would go probably to like i would try to come up and brainstorm things but I, I don't know how to use TikTok. Like I've already aged out, man. I'm 31 and I don't know how to use TikTok. I'm like, I don't know how to edit this stuff. I don't know how to make like crisp looking reels. I It's it's kind of passing me by and I'm not yep. even technically old yet. So I'm like, if you want to keep people interested in it, I love what's happening across the league because I've kind of stopped having the stress of how do I create the crazy, cool, unique stuff? And I'm like, I'm just kind of soaking it in now and enjoying the creativity that is across this country when it comes to football content. Yeah, and and we carve out our, our little niche here, right? Of yeah. like, hey, you know what? You come to us. It, it may not be TikTok worthy. It's not going to be world star. <laughs> Nobody's yelling world star at the end of this. To, That's for such a dated kids. reference. That's so great that you just listed <laughs> that after we say we're getting old. Nobody's yelling world star. Yeah, for young for younger kids, world star was a thing like a decade ago on the internet. Um, <laughs> stuff would happen, but we carve out. We go, hey, here's our our. You're you're more inside the game, having knowing the game from the inside better than, than I do. I've tried to just hammer at it from an analytical perspective and the numbers. Yep. And so we all carve out our little niche and they're all so valuable because a lot of people want what we do. A lot of people want what these teams are putting up. A lot of people want to see Jamarcus Hardrick wearing one of those comically oversized baseball caps <laughs> holding a 32 inch hot dog that they can have at the home opener on Friday, right? Like there's and it's it's fantastic. Uh the San Diego, the LA Chargers. Right, we're going to the beach in in L in whatever L A. And what do these team logos look like? And that one woman became a an internet icon for twenty four hours because the whatever the Atlanta Falcons she thought it looked like a bear <laughs> or whatever red birds or know. something. I don't. Yeah, know. it didn't look like a bird to her. She had no idea what it was and no context, and it became a thing for twenty four hours. It's um, yeah, the the young people decide what's cool is, is probably the best way that everybody should approach their life. You're going to be a point where it's scary and you're uncool and the whole world freaks you out. Just, just know that young people got this. Yep. I agree with you on that. Uh, hang on. I just have to close my lime wire here. I'm, I'm, I got to download some songs, so I'm just gonna, no, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> uh, uh, so let's, uh, hey, hi, there are some the things affordable that just, alternative to Napster. Yeah, yeah. Just don't, don't make sense to people anymore, but that's okay. Um, all right, let's get into the Hamilton Winnipeg matchup a little bit. Uh, I'm going to cover Calgary and BC and all of that good stuff here on, on CFP, but let's get into the game that you will be calling first and foremost. Uh, the question I always have, because I work on my own, sheets to get the year kicked off have you made any tweaks to your preparation dt because i know how much you love the prep and love calling the games on 680 cjob so have you tweaked anything of interest that uh, has been kind of like okay 2023 new year new me let's go ahead and, and get into this yeah i've just tried to automate some stuff to make it easier because if you saw and i've published it on on twitter at dt on ob before the play-by-play board i have like here's zach kalaris 11th year from cincinnati born in 1988, whatever. But then it's like, here's his red zone stats. Here's his cumulative stats. Here's his stats by depth and width of the field. Here's his stats when he's under pressure or not under pressure. It's just numbers. Because yeah. I just want to have access to them to be able to tell the stories. So just to automate some of that. And there's going to be some things that I add into it uh, this year. I was talking to Davis Sanchez at one point last season. And he said we were talking about a guy. And he said, I wonder, I wonder what those interceptions were. He had... X number of interceptions. I wonder what kind of interceptions they were because they're different kind of interceptions. And I went, Ooh, that's really good. Like yeah. if you're sitting in zone and the ball falls in your, in your lap. Okay. You did intercept it, but that's different than Nick Marshall runs stride for stride with a guy and takes it away in man coverage. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, uh, there'll be stuff like that that'll add in and then just refine this and that, but there'll be some extra categories to add into it. And just so that I can have, you know, better stuff to work with to tell stories. One of my favorite things uh, on those zone interceptions is when there's a high corner, usually in the boundary, but a high corner, and the slot back goes to run a five yard out and thinks the corner is low, and he turns and tees it up, and he freaks out the quarterback, and the ball just sails over him as he tees it up, and the corner is like dropped out, sitting ten yards deep. And he just goes, "Really? 
<laughs> and the ball just like hits him square in the chest. Nobody ran him. And then all of a sudden it's just a race for the corner. Right. But yeah, those zone interceptions certainly feel a lot different than some of the elite cover guys in this league. Uh, so that's, that's interesting to hear that you've taken a look at that and that you're trying to, to give people the best broadcast possible. What do you think uh, about Bo Levi's debut here for Hamilton going into Winnipeg? Because it's not as though this is a place he's unfamiliar with. It's not a place yeah. that he's, He's going to go in. I don't think it'd be scared, but I do. I mean, I, I wrote about this game, previewing it for CFL.ca earlier this week, and I genuinely think this is the most difficult introduction to playing for a new team any quarterback could have. And we saw that with Jeremiah Masoli going in and playing there at the start of 2022 after he'd signed up for agency. Like, went in, couldn't finish in the score zone, and isn't able to get the victory. But it you know, like Winnipeg whether it be the crowd or the defense, is such a difficult place for any quarterback to go in. But to do it in week one with a new franchise after just a training camp and like a half of preseason, I think that's an incredible challenge. Yeah, and there's two kind of ways that I approach the, the Bo Levi Mitchell that we'll see on Friday. One is what does Hamilton let him do, right? Bo kind of rose to prominence and, and became this superstar in our league. Because he hammered the ball down the field. Yeah. He was the deepest passer in the league for a couple of seasons. And I remember the 2017 Grey Cup, I'd had his his target chart and Ricky Ray's target chart. And if you're listening to this, you realize those two could not be more different, right? Yeah. Ray's arm topped out at 44 yards, and he worked the perimeter, and he worked the short game. Bo attacked deep middle more than anybody which you don't see, right? Because we have a, we're in a game with one safety. So who attacks deep middle? There's a guy standing there. Well, Bo didn't care. He's like, yeah. I don't care. I'm going to get the ball there and it would work. So uh, last year in Calgary, my perception was we want to control things a little better. We want to, okay, we want what became an offense that was incredibly boring for me to watch. Like, yep. okay, it's minus four yards to Reggie Bagleton. There's a five yard hook. Ugh, ugh, okay. Yeah. Wake me, wake me when charting this game is over, right? If you're asking Bo to do that, uh, that's not taking advantage of his strengths, are which are you know high leverage throws. So does Hamilton one let him let him move the ball down the field? They've got the receivers to do that with, right? With Tim White, with Duke Williams, uh, Godwin at the at that X position, they've got guys that can do that. Worst case scenario, throw a jump ball for Duke Williams and test what's going on, and then with that. How quickly do the Bombers respond to that? And how will – this is a relatively young defensive back six for the Bombers, right? As good as Evan Holm has looked at halfback in practice, he's in his second year, and he's going to play under 10 games in the Canadian Football League. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Demario Houston, he's in his third year, but he played some last year, rarely the year before. He's got to fill in for Winston Rose. How, how will the field side, being Holm and Desmond Lawrence and Alden Darby – respond to that so that's that's kind of uh that's kind of the first one one for me of how how is this going to go for Bo, and then how will the bombers respond to it because uh as we get a little nerdier the bombers i went back and counted the two games they played Bo levi mitchell last season they blitzed only 13 times combined in two games wow which is the least they blitzed anybody all last season long on a percentage basis and the least any team blitzed any quarterback as best i can tell last season because we well I, I i don't know the reason why but i part of it is Bo might rip us in half if yeah. we blitz him the wrong way right and if we're not ready to respond so how will richie hall approach that part of it i'm super curious to see and how will hamilton let Bo attack because i don't i don't i left 2022 thinking calgary didn't let Bo be Bo. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel very similar about that, and we both feel very similar about the way that Calgary ended last year. I'm really hoping that we'll be proven wrong on here on kickoff night Thursday night that the Calgary Stampeders are not going to be what they were down the stretch for the majority. It was crazy, cool. even in the playoff game in BC, how Jake Mayer gets pulled and immediately Bo comes in, and you're like, whoa, hey, th wait, that's why we love Bo, because he was so much fun. Look at that. And again, not slander against Jake Mayer. It's just the fact that like Jake was playing a dramatically different game structurally than Bo Levi Mitchell had pretty much his entire Stan Peters career. And the discrepancy between those two, seeing them in the same game in the playoffs in short back-to-back -back little spurts, you were just like, Oh yeah, this is totally different. And it's like, but they chose the thing that's a little bit more, <laughs> I don't know, reduced, relaxed, like conservative, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, I'm I'm terrified that we have to chart Calgary Saskatchewan this year, like several times because I'm worried. I'm worried. Oh, I'm worried yeah. about Trevor versus Jake Mayer if they play the way that they did for the majority of last year when they were both in but we'll we'll tackle that monster when we get to it down the road perhaps but uh the jake conser- mayer's a dot oh my god i was gonna say the conservative bull maybe we'll uh, we'll uh, <laughs> label that one we'll find out but um the the thing i'm really interested in too gt is that for hamilton you and i have have long discussed tommy condell in the running game Right, where it's yep. everybody's getting a bunch of touches and a bunch of different guys, and it's all kind of equal at the end of the year, and nobody really runs away with the touches and all the rest. And that hasn't always been by choice. Sometimes it's been due to injury or otherwise. But they go out and get James Butler. And when Bo Levi is trying to uh, go into Winnipeg against the noise, and, and he said in his press conference at the end of the practice week for Hamilton that when you go in, you have to have championship-level communication at the line of scrimmage, getting in, getting out, talking to your receivers, all the rest, if you want to if you want to have success in Winnipeg. You have to do that. He was basically like, that's non-negotiable. That's a thing that has to happen if you're going to even come close to winning. The other thing I think that has to happen is you have to get at least two or three high quality runs. And that doesn't mean 60 yard barn burners that go for touchdowns. That means second and eight and you sneak a first down on a draw. Like you have to get a couple of those in order to win those difficult road games. And with Bo being in the backfield with Butler, I'm interested this season to see what happens, not only with the workload that's given to Butler or the decision-making in run or pass play calling, but also There's this interesting tension there where it's like you get Bo, he's highly motivated, you got a great cup hosting year, you want to be able to rip that thing all over the place and be super entertaining, but you also went out in free agency and prioritized this running back. So what are you doing with that guy? Because I don't think James Butler's going to come in after the year he had in BC and be happy just standing there in pass protection for 85% of the snaps on the season. I could be wrong. Maybe he just wants a chance to win a great cup and he doesn't care how much he gets used, but... That's something to keep a close eye on, I think, throughout not only this game, but really the first chunk of the season is what rhythms do they establish? What do they decide they want to do? What is their identity offensively? Because there's so many moving pieces here. Yeah, the the James Butler free agent acquisition is the one I least understand in the entire CFL, I think, Mm -hmm. this year. Because you mentioned the numbers we've talked about for folks who didn't didn't hear it. Hamilton hasn't given 50% of their running back carries to a single running back since 2018. And last year, I know Orlando Steinauer said it's injuries and stuff, but there were games where it was a ratio thing that they would bench Don Jackson and put in Sean Thomas Erlington. And I go, okay, but you paid Don Jackson, so make the ratio work somewhere else, unless you, like me, believe running backs don't particularly matter. And then, I, yeah, I win. But it's, <laughs> it's just super that, – that is super interesting. Uh, the thing for this one is STE starts on the six-game injured list, so maybe yeah. it will be a ton of Butler. The, the thing I'm so curious about is – uh, I'll look at, uh, you know, where the ball is on the field, down a distance, compare a guy's runs to the runs that have happened, you know, in the last decade or whatever. Uh, James Butler last year was 120 yards below expected. Hmm. Like, or below average is probably a better way to phrase that. Like, Butler was not an elite carrier of the football last season. And there's other things that go into being the running back for sure. But, like, Kadeem Carey was up here. Frankie Hickson was just below him. And then you had a bunch of guys – kind of below average as far as, to, you know, when you get a lot of carries, you're going to get a lot of yards, but congrats, it was 4.4, like 4.6, whatever it is. I know he started hot, but then Butler goes off a cliff, comes back toward the end of the season, and then holds steady. But an average back gets more yards than James Butler did, so I kind of don't – this might be my ignorance, but I don't understand why Hamilton paid James Butler all that money. Yeah, and that's why I think I want to watch it closely because – like as much as I'm going to be watching Bo and does he look comfortable in the pocket and is he throwing it confidently and who's he really you know meshing with well at the receiver position? I I think him and Godwin might just be a freaky tandem that's going to come out of nowhere and just shock people. But if if I'm being honest, I'm also going to be watching James Butler and not just his you know let's say he plays 25 30 snaps in the first half and I want to see what he looks like in that offense judging right away out the gate, we're always guilty of it. You and I will both be watching the game tonight. The first 10 snaps will happen. We'll overreact to everything because we're just hungry for CFL football. It's going to be a long season. I want to see how that trends over the long term. But in the short term, 
how are they going to use him and, and what is their preference going to be in terms of where to place him and how to try and give him different reads and what type of stuff are they going to run with him when they are trying to get him the football. So um, I think that's all up in the air going into Friday night in Winnipeg. Uh, the other games from around the Canadian Football League after opening night here, what else has your attention? I guess for, for me, I would just throw out there that anytime that Chris Jones is taking on Saskatchewan, that's that's got an interesting kind of flavor to it, but uh, Ottawa, Montreal as well with Toronto being the odd man <laughs> once again this year with a week one by, uh, <laughs> but out of those other two games in Ottawa, Montreal and Edmonton, Saskatchewan, what are you looking at? Oh, Edmonton Sask. I'm super curious. Uh, Cause hands up. If you got Edmonton at plus money before the line flipped, cause I did. Um, I, I think Saskatchewan is going to be fifth in the West. Right. So this will be my first chance to even if even with Trevor Harris, you know, will I be correct on that? And I think at, we've talked a bunch about this. I'm not Taylor Cornelius guy. There is so much talent on that team, on that offense, especially if the offensive line, if the tackles hold up those receivers. Oh, man. Like there's a point where Cornelius won't be able to underthrow all of them all the time. Like there's just so much talent. On that defense, that front is is pretty nice as well. And they have Chris Jones guys littered all through that defense as well, right? Ganey, Purifoy, uh, AC Leonard as well. Uh, Jamin Pelly, I haven't seen him if he played preseason, but when he's back, he eats up space. Jake Ceresna was a top five defensive player in the league last year yeah. for the games he was able to play. I... I was on a podcast that picked uh, Edmonton to finish second in the West, and I I feel a little bad about that because it all revolves around the quarterback in football, but I kind of don't because Chris Jones, year one over year two in Sask, dramatic improvement if they do so. And by the way, they've gotten this elite offensive talent to join the team. I feel like second place in a muddled West, you know, if, it's, if 10 wins gets you second place, Edmonton's going to be in the mix for that in my mind. CFL and TSN preview show, Matt Dunnigan was talking about the quarterback carousel, and I really hadn't realized it, but I mean, like, VA being one of the only guys that's back with the same team along with Jake Mayer, but neither of them played the full year. Other than Zach Laros, that's pretty much it, right? You bounce around the leagues like, yeah, Cornelius, but he didn't start the year, and then you go to Calgary with the situation with Bo Levi and Mayer, and then you go to Saskatchewan where it's Fajardo and Fine, and now it's Trevor Harris, and Montreal Mm -hmm. had Trevor Harris, and they move on, and now they got Fajardo. So this thing just kind of, like, spun... Pick your biggest mystery to me. Who's your biggest mystery quarterback? And I'm I'm prefacing this because you already mentioned Taylor Cornelius, and I know he's very much in the discussion. But I'm wondering if there's another name for you on top of Taylor Cornelius that you view as being the biggest mystery, as in, when I say mystery, I don't mean what is this player. I mean, mm. what is this player going to be this year in this team? Because there's so many moving parts right now for these quarterbacks in a lot of these markets. Yeah, I feel like I know what Taylor Cornelius is, is going to be. Cody Fajardo, to me, will be that one. Uh, now the quarterback in Montreal. I think, I feel like I'm one of the only guys that that is a backer of Fajardo left in the Canadian Football League after what that 2022 season was in SAS. I think Fajardo's, in, I think he's an accurate passer, like above average accuracy, which is a great place to start. Yes, there have been deep ball struggles the last couple of years. But that that does fluctuate, so two down years doesn't doesn't shock me from a statistical perspective. And by the way, he could still move. Like he was hampered at the beginning of last year. I think it was just the beginning of last year, but he was hampered. That guy can move and he can run and he can get out of the pocket. Be it designed run game, be it in the scramble game. I I I feel like that's that's the mystery. I feel like he he would have to lift up that offense because uh, I don't see a ton of talent on that Montreal offense. And I was reading a Herb Zerkowski thing the other day that was talking about receivers where it's like, yep, t- you're going to have Tyson Philpott down for a little bit here. Greg Ellingson's dealing with some injuries. And it was basically like they've got Cole Speaker, who was on the practice roster. Uh, it looked very good at the game that I covered at the end of the season, Montreal-Toronto, but still doesn't have a lot of experience. And it's like they got that. And they're going to lean heavily on Kayon Julian Grant. And I'm like, I, that's wicked. I hope, but I'm like, you got teams that are leaning on like Geno Lewis and Reggie Begleton and Malik Henry and Dalton Schoen and Kenny Lawler. And, and you're going to answer that with no disrespect, but you're going to answer that with Cam Julian Grant. Like you think he's going to be yeah. the dude that's, that's 
to me, that's a tough spot. The thing that I'm interested in specifically with Fajardo before I give my mystery quarterback situation is uh, I am slightly concerned, not that I think that Jason Moss is like some serial quarterback abuser when it comes to, you know, there's (laughs) there's some coaches out there, specifically at the university level in Canada, who shall remain nameless as of right now because I, I rather enjoy talking to them. Uh, but if you watch university football, you know some guys really love running the quarterback. And usually when it comes to playoff time, that bites them in the ass uh, because they run their quarterback so much, they get banged up. And by the end of the season, they're not the player that they were at the start of the season. I kind of get worried that if Montreal doesn't have that passing game to throw themselves into games, which, by the way, side note, the only thing that makes me really hesitant about Cody Fajardo is that I have never liked his mechanics. He looks, oh, okay. he labors to throw the ball sometimes, which I think affects the deep ball stuff. But if they can't move the ball through the air, I wonder if Jason Moss doesn't just go, we got a couple of fullbacks, we got William Stanback, we got Jezra Antwi, we got Walter Fletcher, and we have a running quarterback. And all of a sudden, I'm not saying they're going to be running the wing T, but what yeah. I am saying is I wonder whether or not if they struggle, not necessarily week one, but maybe weeks two, three, something like that, they start to transition more towards a let's go a little bit more quarterback run heavy because let's get the best out of Cody because Cody's a big dude <laughs> like he can take hits but at what point like where is that breaking point because I I just get concerned that if you start to reach like if the Tiger Cats don't move the ball effectively through the air they're not going to reach by trying to run Matthew Schiltz in between the tackles once every five plays I get yeah. concerned that that might be a transition an evolution of that Montreal offense if they do run into some passing struggles. Uh, my mystery quarterback uh, situation is Chad Kelly. Uh, I know yeah. he's not he's not playing this week, but TSN is guilty of promoting the hell out of this dude. Like, when I came out of a, a camping trip with my son and my parents, I came back and I was like, oh, man, like I got to download like a lot of information here to get ready for the season. And I opened up TSN.ca. There was like six features on Chad Kelly. There was It was like a million different ways to cover this dude, which I get it. In Toronto, big name, the history, the family connections to Jim, all the rest. It's great stuff. By the way, the feature Matt Dunn and, and Dave Naylor did, I thought was absolutely tremendous on Jim Kelly and Chad Kelly. With that being said, uh, there's a ton of hype. It's a guy who's in the Canadian Football League because things did not work out in the NFL because of off-field, not because of necessarily on-field stuff. It was just too much that for teams to deal with. And he comes up here, and everyone's really, really, really excited. I covered Manziel in 2018 in Hamilton. I'm not saying they're the same guy. What I am saying is anytime that a quarterback comes up really hyped and people get excited about it, I kind of get scared. And the reason that I kind of get scared is he's playing at home in week one. You don't think Bo Levi Mitchell who's pissed off at Calgary for the way that thing ended, regardless of what he says, because Bo was a proud guy, isn't going to go in to BMO Field in week two on a Sunday night and say, I got kicked out of Calgary. I'm coming in here. I'm now part of the black and gold, the QEW rivalry against the Argonauts. And you got this dude on the other side that everybody's in love with? Watch this. Like, I kind (laughs) of feel like that teeing up. I know it's week two and we're just going into week one here. But Chad Kelly having to deal with being the quarterback now for the defending Grey Cup champions, for being in Toronto, for taking over a leadership role, all of those things, uh, I have no idea what that's going to look like. I I mean, Ryan Dinwiddie's going to shape it the best he can, but I'm just like, I don't know what that's going to be. So that's what that's my answer. Yeah, we we get sold a a lot of big name American quarterbacks a lot of times and try to find examples of guys who failed in a regular season can be a little tough. Because a lot of them just don't make it out of training camp. Right. Right. Didn't last year the Elks had JT Barrett and Cardell Jones? And you went, okay, not I, I haven't seen either of them. There's this an, an endless number of examples of big name American quarterbacks that came up and never did anything. So I, I just refuse to get to the hype of, well, it's going to be this one now because right. we've just been seeing it too many times of, Zach Kolaris wasn't a, wasn't a big name and wasn't hyped and wasn't in the NFL or bad boy his way out of the NFL. He's phenomenal. Yep. Bo Levi Mitchell, Michael Riley, on and on and on. Like, great that you had that, but I it doesn't tell me anything about what kind of player you're going to be in this game because there's so many things you have to do to be a successful quarterback. Period at the professional level that 
I just, what I know about Chad Kelly is the Argos would not have won the Grey Cup in my mind if Kelly doesn't go into that game. Yeah, I feel like he changed everything in that game or it all changed around him in that game. Beep, boop, 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 boop. They score and they eventually win the game. I feel like that's all I know about Chad Kelly. And that's the tiniest of sample sizes. So, yeah, yeah I, I have a... Uh, as you may know, there there's gambling around. Uh, you may see gambling <laughs> ads on TV every once in a while. There was a prop wager that was pick a range of wins for a team, and we'll pay. We'll get you this price. So uh, I, at seven to one, I got the Argos to have between four and six wins. Hmm. And I went. They won eleven last year. They lost their quarterback, and they what was their point differential last year? Like plus four, and they're yeah, at eleven and seventeen. Close. Yeah, that's not, that's not the the point differential of a above 500 teams. So I'm like a regression from the quarterback because I, McLeod Bethel Thompson was just fine. It could be great. could be bad. And I just, I just don't know, but the odds are they're a little bit worse than they were last year because they went from MBT to a different quarterback. Yeah. And the last thing that I'll say here about the quarterback discussion, I guess is, uh, is that in Ottawa, Nick Arbuckle is going to be the starter for weeks one and two, Jeremiah Masoli down. Uh, it's a great opportunity for Arbuckle to prove that he's better than he's been you know that he's kind of become a bit of a, a joke at various points in the last couple of years where our, our buckle got traded again oh look he got moved Unfairly, it's, yeah right and it's like okay now you've had a year to, to actually be in that place and it's like you've been with your family you're solidified you're not getting traded three times in two years and you're just there what can you do like and then i think that's a tremendous opportunity for him but again as somebody who spends a lot of my time covering teams in the east we're talking about mystery quarterback situations we've talked about fajardo in montreal what is Bo Levi going to look like in Hamilton? You got the Ottawa situation with Masoli coming off a broken leg and Arbuckle trying to prove himself. And then you got Chad Kelly, right? Trying to be in yeah. there and, and figure out what he's going to be. And, and there's an opportunity for him to be fantastic. If you talk to Jim Barker, Jim Barker thinks that he's going to be the best quarterback in the CFL. But there's a lot of things that go into that. And it's not necessarily always just the pure talent. So uh, DT, let people know where they can get a hold of you coming up on Friday night, game night on 680 CJOB. Yeah, you can get to us online. The Radio Player app is where I find it. What I need to stream, 680 CJOB. Uh, 7.30 local time is a kickoff. So Doug Brown and Ed Tate, we have, we have a cast of thousands on the pregame <laughs> show starting at 5.30, uh, 6.30 Eastern if you want to compare it to your time zone. Uh, I don't know what time it is in Saskatchewan, but we have a lot of Saskatchewan folks that listen to us these days. I appreciate that. I still don't know what time it is there because – we're all doing it weird, and you guys understand that we don't need daylight savings. Yep. Uh, but yeah, at DT on OB, DT on at CGO on CGOB on and uh, what's that one? What do the kids call that one with the pictures and the, the IGs? Uh, IG, yeah, on IG. <laughs> Oh, that's my, Mark, that's my got, favorite thing is people get older is they just start putting s's at the end of things like is that the instagrams <laughs> yeah, well you're still many years away from that but uh yeah it's it's coming for us all so let the kids let the kids take care of that all good dt's got lots of great stuff coming out make sure you're following along and enjoying the bombers broadcast as well we'll catch up with you uh not next week because i'm going to be hiding in the trees in vermont uh, but we will, well, we will talk the week after, and we will be breaking down weeks one and two as we head into week number three. Thanks, Derek. Good to talk with you, buddy. Thanks, brother.